We're very familiar with temperature as a measure of how hot or cold things are. What our bodies detect as hot or cold, and the extent of how hot or cold something feels, is dictated by the amount of heat transfer between us and the substance touching our skin. When you reach a heat transfer course, you'll learn a lot more about this, but for now, and assuming we're touching an object meaning conductive heat transfer, or just standing in an environment without any wind meaning natural convection, the amount of heat transfer will be proportional to the temperature difference. So it is correct to say that something feels cold if it has a temperature lower than our body surface temperature and its temperature is even lower the colder it feels. However, in a course like heat transfer, you'll learn how, for example, through forced convection, a cold day with lots of wind can feel even colder than the temperature you'd expect it to be. A 20 degrees Celsius day, that's 68 Fahrenheit, with lots of wind can feel like a 10 degrees day, that's 50 Fahrenheit with no wind. This is all to say that our perception and therefore definition of temperature is very limited and most of the time inaccurate. Luckily, many properties of materials and substances change with temperature in a repeatable and predictable way. And this is our basis for accurate temperature measurement. For example, the expansion of a metal like mercury, which is how older thermometers worked. Thermal equilibrium is when there is no net flow of thermal energy between two systems that are connected by a path permeable to heat. For example, if we drop a block of metal into water, like one of the examples of the previous lecture, link below, and neither the metal nor the water gain or lose energy in the form of heat, they were and are in thermal equilibrium. The same could not be said of a hot piece of metal in a cold bucket of water. A hot piece of metal would transfer some heat to the water, making the water rise in temperature and the metal decrease in temperature. The Seeroth law of thermodynamics says that when two objects are in thermal equilibrium with a third object, they are in thermal equilibrium with each other. This just means that the transitive relation, if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C, is applicable to thermal equilibrium. This allows us to assess thermal equilibrium of two objects that are not connected by a path permeable to heat. If two objects are not touching each other, as an example of two objects that are not connected by a path permeable to heat, we can only state that they are in thermal equilibrium with each other using the zeroth law of thermodynamics. This is what allows us to define temperature. If two objects are in thermal equilibrium, regardless of if they are connected, they have the same temperature. This law was established in 1939 by Ralph Fowler. It was formulated 89 years after the first and second law were established, but it was already being used empirically and should have been established long before the second and first laws, and that's why it was labeled the Seeroth law. Now, what is temperature? In simple terms, a bit oversimplified to be fair, temperature is nothing more than the kinetic energy of the molecules in a system. Zero Kelvin, absolute zero temperature, would therefore mean that the amount of kinetic energy within a substance is a zero, or in other words, that zero Kelvin means the absence of thermal energy. As the molecules inside the system start vibrating and gaining kinetic energy, the temperature begins to rise. A hotter substance just means that its molecules have more kinetic energy than another substance, and this is true for any state, even solids. Of course, like I said, this is a simpler explanation of what temperature is, although it's still true for ideal gases, which we'll learn more about in a future lecture. Quantum physics have now advanced enough to understand, define, and even measure temperature much more accurately by taking into account quantum effects. But for the purposes of this course, Understanding that temperature is related to thermal internal energy and that it can be objectively quantified is enough. And of course, we have four units for defining temperature. Oh, and by the way, before we talk about anything related to temperature units, remember that you don't say 20 degrees Kelvin. Kelvin is a unit itself. You do say degrees Celsius, but not degrees Kelvin, just Kelvin. In the US and just a handful of places on the entire planet, Fahrenheit is the go-to temperature unit for things like weather or knowing if you have a fever. Everywhere else in the world, degrees Celsius is the standard. Basically, we use Fahrenheit if using English units and Celsius when using metric. 
The relationship between these two is linear with the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit being 9 fifths of the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 32. Kelvin goes with Celsius in the sense that it's just a shift of the same Celsius scale. This metric unit is just 273.15 degrees more than Celsius. But if there is an increase or decrease of let's say 20 degrees Celsius, there is an increase or decrease of 20 Kelvin. In other words, the change in temperature in Kelvin or degrees Celsius is the same. This will be really important for some of our heat calculations in future lectures and examples. Just as some temperature values examples here, the freezing temperature of pure water is for example 0 Celsius or 273.15 Kelvin. Boiling temperature for pure water at sea level is roughly 100 degrees Celsius or 373.15 Kelvin. And so on and so forth. And finally we have Rankine. Just like Kelvin is 2 Celsius, Rankine is just a shift of the Fahrenheit scale. Fahrenheit and Rankine are both English units, just like Celsius and Kelvin are metric units. Rankine is just 459.67 more than degrees Fahrenheit, and zero Rankine is also the absence of thermal energy, just like zero Kelvin. And just like we related Celsius and Fahrenheit, Rankine and Kelvin can also be related. Notice that it's still the same 9 over 5 slope for the linear relationship we have, except they both begin in the absolute zero, and therefore have no shift for their y-intercept of that y equals to mx plus b line that describes their relationship. Let's look at a very simple example today. I usually have more complex examples linked in the description of these main lecture videos, but in this case, since all we defined here today was the relationship between units, We'll only have this one simple example and we'll keep using temperature changes in future examples related to more complex topics. The link to the next main lecture video on open and closed systems and intensive and extensive properties is found in the description of this video, so make sure to check that out. A hot cup of coffee is currently at 80 degrees Celsius. After 10 minutes, the coffee has dropped 8 degrees Celsius. Express this decrease in temperature in Kelvin, degrees Fahrenheit, and Rankine. To find the change in temperature delta T for each one of the different units, we will need to find the initial and final temperatures in each one of the different units. Let's find the initial temperature in all three units first. Using the expressions we defined just now, 80 degrees Celsius is equal to 9 fifths times 80 plus 32, or 176 degrees Fahrenheit. 80 degrees Celsius is also equal to 80 plus 273.15 or 353.15 Kelvin. And 176 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 176 plus 459.67 or 635.67 Rankine. A drop of 8 degrees Celsius brings the final temperature to 72 C. Going over the same set of calculations, we obtain 161.6 degrees Fahrenheit, 345.15 Kelvin, and 621.27 Rankine. In terms of calculations, this is a very simple problem. The takeaway is what is most important though. The change in temperature delta T in Celsius is minus 8 degrees Celsius and also minus 8 in Kelvin. The change in temperature delta T in Fahrenheit is 14.4 degrees Fahrenheit and 14.4 Rankine. This means that any time we are looking for a change in temperature in Celsius, we do not need to do the unit conversion from Kelvin, or vice versa. For example, from the examples of our previous lecture, the specific heat of water can be written as 4184 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin or kilojoules per kilogram degree Celsius. Or what is the same if the specific heat of a substance is given in kilojoules kilogram Kelvin, but we have temperature changes in degrees Celsius, we can still use the given specific heat without doing any unit conversion. This is true for degrees Fahrenheit and ranking, of course. Remember to check the links in the description of this video to find the other lectures of the thermal course and lectures for other engineering courses like mechanics of materials, statics, solid works, fluid mechanics, etc. Thanks for watching.